we've all been in situations where you just need God to show up, right? And and you just wonder where he is, where he is, where he is. And it seems like he's invisible. We are, our verse, our passage for this year is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. You should know that by now. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are the visible representatives of an invisible kingdom. People, are, you probably hear people say, where is God when this happened? Where is God in the midst of it? We are his ambassadors. We are his visible representatives of his invisible kingdom. We are supposed to represent a king that people cannot see. So Purim is uh, a, again, starts tomorrow night, starts at sunset. Why? Because the day starts at sunset in the Jewish calendar, because God said it was evening and it was morning and it was the next day. So that's how scripture counts a day starting at sunset, not at midnight, which is really unmeasurable if you don't have a watch. So um, if he died on Friday and rose on Sunday morning, that's not three days. It's not a full three days. It's not 72 hours, but oh. it's three days. Friday, Saturday, Sunday was three days. It was, yeah, early Sunday morning, yeah. Well, it's just like the ladies being in the street that they can three days, but not really. You think about the time span, yeah. Friday night, all day Saturday, and half a day Sunday. Kind of the same thing. Yeah, yep. Days. So when we arrived in Israel in 2019, Tina, what was the guy, the lady dressed up as that met us at the gate? Why? What was she dressed up as all? Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, the devil? Yes. She's this lady that met us at the, because her airports are closed now, so they have to have agents that take you to your tour guide and your bus leader. They can't come in and get you. And this lady little devil horns and tail and everything. And we're like, oh, what's going on? It was what? Purim. What? It was Purim. So Purim is like their oh, Halloween. Oh, you mean when we were in Hillary? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So they uh, they dress up for that. Well, why do they dress up for that? So what is Purim? Purim is a celebration from the Bible, remembering yet another time in history when the Jews were about to be annihilated and God stepped in. It's another yeah. history of celebrating that. Because remember, what other times did it happen? Passover. Passover, which was in Egypt. Egypt. What other one? When Herod was trying to kill the... Herod was trying to kill baby Jesus, but that wasn't a, the nation of Israel. But okay. definitely the promise of God, for sure. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Times when we, the Jews celebrate when they were someone tried to annihilate him and God delivered him. Yes, sir. Okay. Hanukkah, right? Remember, because he, the came, the Syrian Empire was trying to erase the Jews as well. That's there, and then of course we it's not a celebration, but World War II, uh, the Holocaust. They were trying to be, you know, they they tried to uh, not be tried to eliminate them, but unlike Passover. Purim is known as the most raucous of the Jewish celebrations. It's not a, it's not one of the required feasts of, of Judaism, but it is one that's, uh, even if you're not a religious practicing Jew, uh, you get into Purim because you get to dress up any way you want to, and you're supposed to get as drunk, so drunk that you don't recognize the difference between Mordecai and Haman. So the, that's, it's one of the expectations of, of it that you do. Now there's the rabbis have different interpretations of what that means. One includes you just drink yourself to sleep and then, you know, but you're supposed to drink lots of wine and we'll see that as that plays out. Dressing up, we'll get there. Oh, give me okay. give me a chance. You guys are jumping ahead. You know, jump, give me. You're supposed to dress up in costumes. There's Purim plays that happens. The whole story is read aloud. And as you do it, whenever you hear Haman's name, you you boo. Whenever you hear, you know, there's different things you do as you, as you read scripture. It's very much a celebratory event when you go to a synagogue everybody goes shows up dressed in costumes there's a big meal there is fasting that leads up to it because of what we read earlier the passage we read earlier uh that uh she had asked for the people to pray uh, and fast for three days it's also expected that you'll give charity to at least two people so fasting praying sounds a lot like lent at this point and again there's lots of wine that's in uh involved in it so it becomes, it's a very uh, popular holiday in israel when we showed up our, we couldn't even get our bus to our hotel because the streets were blocked. It took us probably an extra 45 minutes to get to our hotel. 
And then there was a massive festival that was happening in town with stage and TV and lights and dancing and carnival games and all kinds of stuff that was that was happening when it was there. So it's a, it's, it's a big deal. So again, it from the book of Esther, comes from the book of Esther, the story of Esther. So during the Babylonian exile, so we're after David, all the great, 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 great grandsons of David, all those generations, northern empires sent off into exile in Assyria. The southern kingdoms uh, is sent into exile into Babylon. While they're in Babylon, the Persian king Xerxes, which uh, the only thing I think of is the movie 300. And in terms of, to think of a king that relates in terms of history, uh, he's having a party with lots of wine. Again, this is where the wine begins for his empire, celebrating how big his empire. 126 different kingdoms are involved in this empire. And his wife offends him so badly that he sends her off into exile and he decides he needs a new wife. So the Jews are living in the uh, empire uh, at that point. Again, they've been exiled. Chapter. These are the chapters. Chapter two, these descendants, specifically a descendant of Saul, this is very important. Uh, here, they're both uh, Mordecai and Esther are descendants of Saul. This will become important because chapter three, we learn about who the bad guy Haman is. And he's actually, he Correct. is promoted to the chancellor of the empire. But his family is important because King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15 destroyed all the Amal Amalekites except King uh, Agag, King Agag, he keeps alongside, and that's when Daniel comes along and he says, "Why did you let this guy live? God told you to kill him." And yeah. so he's like, "No." And he, so he actually Samuel does the deed instead of, but his son escapes, and his son becomes has his own line, and they, and so this guy that we're going to meet, Haman, is a descendant of King Agag, the Agagite. That's why they call him an Agagite, yeah. and um, so he is part of that. So. Haman or Mordecai? Haman. Haman. Mordecai is a descendant of Saul. Agag is a descendant of the guy he killed. That's so, so Saul like killed all the Amalekites. They don't exist anymore except this line of this kid. So this kid is like, these Jewish people destroyed my people. So he comes with the chip on his shoulder when he comes to the story. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the bottom line. He comes with the chip on his shoulder. And so... Sorry. You're, but you said Esther comes from the line too? Of Saul. Yeah, so it's more. He's a cousin of Mordecai. Okay. It's her uncle. Actually, it's her uncle. Yeah. Okay. Uncle. I know yeah. that. Mordecai is an uncle of Esther. Yes. Yeah. Haman is an Agagite. And if you trace the history, you wouldn't. Again, these are the hidden pieces. If you just look at it, tells it tells us that Mordecai and Esther are descendants of Kish. Mm -hmm. Kish was Saul's grandpa, so uh, or his father. So if if you don't know your Bible, you're not going to put all this together. You got to do research. These are some of those hidden pieces, mm -hmm. which is why they wear costumes because there's a lot that's hidden in this book that you have to you have to dig out. Mm -hmm. uh, Esther is going to remain hidden. Uh, God's going to remain hidden in this book, and so you have to dig mm -hmm. out, dig it out. You have to pay attention. So you wouldn't know if you didn't know Scripture. You wouldn't know. That an Agagite is the descendants of this king that had been killed, okay. the Amalekites that had been killed. And you wouldn't know if you didn't pay attention that uh, Mordecai and Esther are descendants of Saul. Mm -hmm. All right. So those are those are not like the story doesn't say it does the story doesn't put all this together. You got to put it all together yourself. All right. We caught up. Steve, you look like you have a question. Can, no. can, uh, can you just tell us how Haman is he related to Esther and Mordecai? No. He's no, he's a, bad, he's a okay. whole different he's nation. Okay. He's okay. a whole different nation. Okay, that's that's what what I said that. That's why I, I, I said what? That Haman was an aggregate. Haman is an aggregate. Mm -hmm. No, I got that now. Their stories are related through Saul, but they are not related. ethnically related. Okay. So Haman comes to the story with a chip on his shoulder because of the Jewish people destroying his whole people. As far as he's concerned, they did a Holocaust on him. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to do everything he can. So ch chapter three, he comes up with a plot, destroy all the Jews. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so he he, uh, he does that and he chooses the date for that 
using a dait, and dait in their language is called a pur, and plur of pur is called purim. So purim is, uh, the, that's where the name purim comes from, all right? So again, God is hidden in this book. There's, in fact, there's a, it, it, there's a huge disagreement, historically had been a huge disagreement among the Jews as, as to whether this book should even be included in scripture. But God's not mentioned. Because God's not mentioned. In fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written by a sect of Judaism that didn't include it because God's name is not mentioned in there. So, but again, if you pay attention, you will clearly see his hand. And that's what I want to point out as we're reading this story. So we're going to start with chapter four as we read this. And because it's a lot of reading, I want to take turns reading. So uh, who would like to read chapter four for us? Okay, go for it. It's in, is it, in on the it is on the U version. So if you can read your U version, you can do it there. Well, I'm here, but it's kind of dark. Actually. Okay, we can turn the lights up. You know what you turn the light up? Because I decided to wear contacts today. It's not working. Okay. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city, crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. Mm. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many lay in burlap and ashes. So as they people start discovering about this plan that Haman had to have all of them eliminated. Of course, people are in fear and trembling. When Queen Esther's maid and Eunice uh, came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for Hat. Hat. Okay. Hat. Okay. One of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So Hatak went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money the king had promised him in the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hatak a copy of the decree issued in Susa that call for the death of all Jews. Okay. He asked the hey, Hadak to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked, hey, Hat Just say Hattie. Hattie, yeah. <laughs> H. <laughs> to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. Mm -hmm. So Hattie returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. Then Esther told Hattie to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials, even the people and provinces, have known that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king was not called for me to come to him for 30 days. Okay, so just she is the queen, but she isn't seeing the king in a month. So he's got a harem. He doesn't need to have his, she's the queen, she's the highest in the harem. But he hasn't seen, so she's not allowed to see him unless he calls. All right. Just so we know, this isn't an easy thing. And if she goes without being called, her life is, is threatened. Okay, keep going. So Hattie gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent his reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for judge such a time as this. Mm -hmm. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go and gather together oh, all the Jews of Susa and fast them. Do not eat or drink for three days, <laughs> night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, go to the gate of the law, I will go on to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as much as he was told. All right. So that's the end of chapter four. So yeah, at the end of this, that she's having him fast and pray. Notice the king is fast. He he's doing the opposite. He's feasting and and drinking, and she's asking him to do the opposite because why? 
they need God. You've been in a situation where you need God, you need his presence, you need to like, God, where are you? Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's what they're doing. They need him to show up. Who would like to read chapter five? Okay. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the house court. I'm sorry, and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that he obtained that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out his Held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Okay, so there's the first chance right there, right? Mm. That God gives her favor with the king because he didn't have to fear. He didn't. So there's the first opportunity to see the hand down. All right, keep going. Amen. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What will thou, Queen Esther, that, and what is thy request? It shall be given to thee, even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther answered, if it seems good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, call Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the mm -hmm. banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? There's wine again. Mm -hmm. there what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant me petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I have prepared that I shall prepare um, for them. And I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Then went Haman forth that day, joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he had come to his house, he sent and called his friend and Jerish, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him. It, how, it, it, just think about that. He's having a party in his house, invites all his friends out. What's he doing? Bragging on himself. Oh, oh my goodness. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, and, and Haman told of them the glory of his riches and the most student of children of the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of king. Haman said, moreover, yeah, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. Oh, and my. tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availed me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai, that Jew, sitting in the king's gate. Then said Zerah his wife and all his friends unto them, Let a gallow be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged on it. Then go thou in the merrily, then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Rejoicing in evil, mm. right there, right? He's mm. rejoicing because he's going to get to kill somebody. Wow. Yeah, and his wife, it's his wife's idea. It runs in the family. I mean, it did half of them part, fall too far from the tree on that one, right? Okay, chapter six. Okay. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Sixana and Koresh. Okay, so if I can pause for a sec, I don't think I emphasize this enough. In chapter two, when we meet Mordecai, 
he becomes, he finds out a plot that's going to kill the king, and he reveals it, and so he he finds favor, but the king, like King Zulu, he just forgot about it and left it. So this is kind of left in the memory in the back. So we're going to see the hand of God come up as this becomes revealed again. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about the Canna and Tourette, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King yeah. mm -hmm. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed, bestowed on Mordecai for this? So in the middle of the night, he can't sleep. He gets up and reads it, and he reads about. You better see the hand of God. You better see the hand of God. One, God revealed it back in the past. Two, it got written down. And three, right when it needs to, God reminds him. About it. So go ahead. The king's young men who attended him said nothing has been done for him. And the king said, "Who is in the court?" Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having more time hanged on the gallows. That he had prepared for him. Okay, hand of God again, all right? The timing, all that timing, all the orchestra. In the middle of the night, he comes to the palace, mm -hmm. talk to the king. The king's already awake, already, so orchestration. Mm -hmm. okay. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, who would the king delight to honor more than me? <laughs> and Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, <laughs> and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on a horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, oh my. that's the like the worst twist of fate if you're a bad, arrogant, like. Worst possible case scenario. <laughs> so Haman took the robes and the horse, he dressed Mordecai, and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Did, did he see him doing it? You could do just... Yeah. Angry bird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thus shall it be done. You know, you can. Barely well, under his voice, maybe, but he's supposed to be shouting, proclaiming it. All right. And it got no, go ahead. Uh, then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house. Of course, he did. Oh, covered. He's so shamed. And Haman told his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends that everything had happened to him. Oh, my goodness. I'm amazed that he, that's the thing, that's the most shocking statement in the book. Yeah, he, that he, he actually admitted it to his family, what just happened. Then his wise men and his wife, Suresh, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is one of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. His very existence is dependent on a unique twist in history of someone's disobedience to God in the first place. Otherwise, he wouldn't exist at all. He should know what happens to people that come against the hand of God. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Mm -hmm. Chapter 7, who's got it? I got it. Okay. So the king and Haman came to the banquet of Esther the queen. And the king said unto Esther, on the second day at the banquet of wine, what is thy tradition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the queen. And Esther, the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in this night sight, O king, and if it please the king, let me let my life be given me at the petition of my people at my request. Oh. For we are sold, and I am and 
I and my people to be destroyed, to be slain, to perish. If we have been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I I have held my tongue, although the enemy could not counterbill the king's damage. Then the king answered said unto Queen, hence unto Esther the Queen, who is he and where is he? That durst presume in his heart to do so. Here's the interesting thing in all this. This was not done behind the king's back. He actually met back in chapter three. He met with the king and said, King, I know how we can raise some money and I know how we can get rid of some bad people at the same time. Here's what we should do. So the, he knows, the king knows, like was a part of this whole plan. I just, some certain details, Haman must have left out for the king to be kind of blindsided by how this was, this was going to go. So, but again, the hand of God and all of that. Verse six. And this was said, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. <laughs> burn. Freaking burn. <laughs> and the king arising from the banquet of wine and his breath. More wine drinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood up to make queen, make request for his life to ask for the queen. For he saw there was evil determined against him by the king. And the king returned out of the palace garden. To the, into the place of the banquet of wine. So again, they were drinking wine. There we go. And Haman was falling apart upon the bed wherein this was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? <laughs> and he catches him right in the worst possible, the worst possible act. As word went out to the king, the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, Harbona one of the chamberlains, Said before the king, Behold, a, behold also the gal of 50 cubit tie which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good to, to the king. So, so in, in the thing I think is interesting here is this eunuch, uh, Chamberlain, I think your scripture yeah. says, the, this, this guy knew about the gallows that were so, I don't know if he was like assigned to work with Haman or what the process was, but he knew that this is a secret. And he clearly didn't like Haman because it, as soon as he's like, oh, did you know, King, that he built a gallows to, you know, so he kind of rats him out yeah, and yeah. this this process. So I, I think that's a very interesting thing there, too. Go ahead, finish it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who had spoken good for the king, stand within the house of Haman. And the king said, hang him there on burn. <laughs> so they hang Haman on the gallows. Okay. Then the king's wrath was pacified. There you go. Verse 8. It's not over. Chapter 8. Not over till it's over. Chapter 8. Somebody can read it for us. Okay. That same day, King Hazarus. Hazarus gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told him he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from him, Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Everything completely flips around at that point. Now Mordecai is in the head of states. You know they've got the power. They've got his house. Haman's family now has lost everything. Can't see the hand. Esther of God there. again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the agritite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she gave she arose and stood before him. Okay, there's the hand of God again, because there, you still have this imperial law that's enforced. Massive empire. We're not just talking about telling people on the other side of town. You're 127 nations that are part of this thing. This is the United Nations in and of itself. You've got to communicate it, but it, you can't just change the law. It's it's something else. They've got to add something to the law to send it out as they go. So, hand to God and all that, that he gives her favor again. Verse 5. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks that it's the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatchers that Haman, son of Haman, they... Hamadatha. 
they devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? Mm -hmm. King Zetar said, replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jews. Because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have hanged him on the gallows. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with this ring can be Mm-hmm. So now, so the the law the law that went out initially was, hey folks, if you kill Jews, you get to keep their property, and the Jews couldn't do anything about it because this was royal law. So the only way to reverse that was give the Jews the ability to defend themselves, and so that's what they did. At once, the royal secretaries were summoned on the thirty third day of the third month, the month of Sivan. They wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, 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 governors and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people, and also to the Jews and their own script in language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Zerus. I'm sorry, sealed the dispatchers with the king's signet ring and sent them on by mounted couriers who rode past horses, especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed forces of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. Mm. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Zaris was the third, 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. Which is tomorrow, or actually Monday night through Tuesday. So it's really Tuesday day, March 6th this year, but they're in a lunar calendar. So it changes, the date changes, but this year it's on March 6th. That's the actual day that they're celebrating. The copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers, riders, the royal horses raced out, spurred on by the king's command, an edict was also issued in the citadel of Susa. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe mm-hmm. of the linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. Mm-hmm. For the Jews, it was time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, mm-hmm. feasting and celebration. And many people of other nationalities became Jews mm-hmm. because the fear of the Jews had seized them. Mm-hmm. Did Hannah got in any of that? Yeah. All over the place, right? Mm-hmm. I haven't heard his name yet, but he's there. Mm-hmm. Now, the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and the 13th day of the same, when the king's command and edicts were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews had hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them, the hand of God. Verse 16, and it, there's the, the rest of the, up until verse 16, it's just detail about how the fighting went. Now, the rest of the Jews, verse 16, who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Talk about greed. This is all about greed. 75,000 people, at least, this is just the ones that were killed, attack Jewish people to steal their property wasn't because the king said they could. Mm-hmm. Is there a movie about that? It's called, there's a day, like when the government says, you can do whatever you want for 24 hours. Uh, purge, the purge. Yeah. That's what that is. <laughs> do whatever you want to the Jewish people, take whatever you want, you have 24 hours at the other end of it. That's exactly what happens. Verse 20, Mordecai ordered these things recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, 
both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same year by year as the days on which the Jews get relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned from them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into joy. These are the things you're supposed to do, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts to the food, of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and so when Mordecai had written to them. That's, the rest of the book is just a summary of all the things. That he, you see the hand of God in any of any of all that going on? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, all over, right? I mean, because there's just no way some of that stuff would have happened. What are your thoughts? As you read that, where's the Holy Spirit sticking you? Where are you catching it? Where are you? You know, what, what comes to my mind is at God's appointed time. Uh-huh. At his appointed time. You saw that, right? Yeah. He pulled it all together. Even the forgotten was brought to light yeah. at the right time. And here's the other thing that was forgotten. The Agagites, the Amalekites still lived. And God brought them to an end as well. First Samuel 15, Samuel was supposed to eliminate him. This one kid lives, becomes an Agagite. And, and that line lives. And then God takes care of him centuries later. He takes care of what he intended to do in the first place. Yes, he does. He's faithful. I'm, I like that um, many call themselves. Jews, hmm. they were wrapped in. I was just reading that in Isaiah that that many started calling themselves and started writing pieces on them. Hmm. So uh, this part of the the empire, because of the Jewish population, their whole city were Jewish cities. There was the Jews thrived. Jeremiah tells us to Jeremiah twenty nine to pray for the priests and prosperity for the cities. You know, even though they're in captivity, even though they've lost everything, God wants you to pray for the pagan city that you live in and its prosperity. I've heard people say before, I'm not going to I'm not going to pray that Biden or Obama will succeed as president or whatever, because they're they're the, the bad guy. Well, that's not what scripture right. says. Scripture says to pray for the prosperity of the city. Of we should pray for prosperity regardless. Yeah. This is where we live, too. Right. Doesn't matter who's who wins, and um, you should want the peace and the prosperity of that to happen. So Jeremiah said that, that, that we're supposed to be, and so they were there, and the Jewish people flourished in this area. It really took a lot of convincing for some of them to come back when they were given the land to go back, and a lot of them still stayed back there. Up until the 1800s, the Jews thrived in Iraq, what is now called Iraq and Iran, and what had been Persia, and, and the Medes and Persians, and stuff like that. So. Any other thoughts? I like Esther so much. I mean, for such a time as this, that mm -hmm. she stepped into it. But the fact that she was very human and fearful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's real. And, and I guess that's where the encouragement comes for us, is when you're in a situation and you feel like, God, where are you? You're asking me to do the impossible. Mm -hmm. I It would be good to have something to let me know that you're what with me in this. Yeah. I, I will have courage, but just can you give me something? Yeah. And he gave her nothing. And yet she was able to do it because she knew that that's what she was called to. It took some encouragement for sure. She's like, oh, she, she went from fear to, okay, if I die, I die. And that's the reality check, right? There are times. Well, and prayer is again so important yes. so all of the right people. foundationally prayer was important to all of that esther again esther was almost not included because god's name is not mentioned in this book whatsoever and mm -hmm. so some would view this as as a secular book rather than than, than a, one that belongs in scripture but someone said when you can't see the hand of god trust his heart <laughs> right when you can't see the hand of god trust his heart and boy that's as good a practical advice as any of us are ever going to get. Because yeah. we will all regularly get in situations where, Lord, where are you? Mm -hmm. And you can either shake your fist and say, well, then I'm walking away because if you're not with me, I'm not with you. Mm -hmm. People do that all the time. I just had a conversation with someone the other day. Mm -hmm. They said, you know what? You never did anything for me, so... So that's when the rubber meets the road on archaeology. You know, can you still trust his heart when you don't understand? 
Do you still believe in him in the midst of, of all of that? Can you still believe that God is great so I don't have to be in control? Because that's really what this is about. That's that, that's that G. God is great, so I don't have to be in control. Nobody was in control for sure. But God. Even Haman, right? But God. Even Haman, who thought he was in control. I'm going to the Queen's banquet. Only me. And I'm going to take care of that Mordecai. I'm going to build it right in my backyard. I'm going to take it, take it down right now. Take care of this right away. He thought he was in control. It's just resolute, uh, completely obedient. Yeah. There's a, if there's anything about Mordecai, he sticks. He he trusts. Mm -hmm. When he didn't see God's hand, he trusted God's hand. And, and, he, and he did what was right the whole time. Mm -hmm. He always, always did what was right, yeah, even if it was going to cost him. Look like it was going to cost him. His and life. God rewarded him. Yep. Which is an yep. encouragement to us. Yep. God will reward us for yep. good. Even if our reward is not here, but it's with him. So, so, so in the midst of that, if it is true then that God is good and he's in control or he's great and so I don't have to fear, that should give us courage, right? Yeah. Because he's going to ask us to stand in a certain place. For her, it was in front of the king, yeah. in front of the whole empire. He's going to ask us to stand in places or stand for something and, and to be courageous. Yeah, like I was saying to uh, Keanu about uh, town and country. You know, it may be to, for such a time as this, but maybe to speak up and say something about those things that are, that you say should not be. And not to say that it is, but I'm just saying, you know, sometimes those opportunities are before us and it's whether we make ourselves available or not. Well, it's sometimes. just about being intentional, right? Yeah. yeah. How to do it, because I know I've done that before and I, I'm sure I came off as a claiming God, and that's not his way. I think the new word for that is Karen. <laughs> <laughs> the new word for clanging God, gong is Karen. Karen. Uh, Karen. That's what the world would call a clanging gong these days. So that's the new way. So we get a choice, though. It gives us the choice yeah. to remain silent or to take a stand in that. And so I get the question for each of us, because we all get different battles. We've all got different Hamans in our life. We've all got different people that are just, you just know they're out to. So I wish Kathleen was here because she just had a Haman or a Haman in her life, right? Mm. To the place where she lost her job because of it. She gave up her job. She released her job. Because mm -hmm. of it, right. We've all, I mean, that, that was a person for no good reason decided that she just had it out for Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and we've all got there here you go it's got there so there's a situation where you stay where you are stay the mordecai you stand where you where the lord's asking you to stand and have courage in the midst of it and so what what is it that god is asking you to have courage for today mm -hmm. where is he asking you to stand take it and take a stand father thank you for um, gathering us this morning, we pray for our ladies as they head home today, but I pray too for those of us that are here that you give us um, the courage. There's something in our hearts, and I pray you'd raise it up for us even now as we worship. In your son's name we pray. Amen.